This week's conversation is with Dr. Jack Caputo, and we're talking about theology after. And this week, we're going to be talking about theology after Derrida and who knows what else. So, hey, Jack, thanks for being here. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. So um, I've been having these uh, conversations with uh, some friends and, and, and people that I respect a lot and asking them about a sort of seminal figure um, in their life, a thinker, generally um, a philosopher. And I, and I know that um, there are many, but I know that Derrida was, has been and is central to some of your work. So I just wanted to talk with you a little bit about um, how you found Derrida, what you found in Derrida that, that spoke to you or piqued your curiosity and how that impacted your life and particularly how it impacted your religious life and uh, and why you think Derrida has something to say still to everybody, why he's important. So that's the basic scheme, and we can ramble wherever you want to go with any of that. So <laughs> that's, that's, that's all you want to talk about? Then. Just, oh, it's nothing. It's a five-minute <laughs> five conversation. But actually, uh, there were three little figures in my life like that. They sort of marked off the stages of my intellectual biography. And the first was, of course, you know, Thomas Aquinas when I was a young Catholic. Yeah. And, which is the world in which I discovered philosophy. I, I discovered philosophy in the context of uh, Catholicism because philosophy has always been an important part of the Catholic tradition. Yeah. And um, in, I had entered a religious order, and the Catholic religious order, the, the uh, I hesitate to say this because you'll mistake them for the Irish Christian brothers, but they, they were the brothers of the Christian schools. Wow. Not the Irish Christian brothers who are involved in all of these scandals, but um, the, this is a French order founded by Jean-Baptiste de La Salle. Who, so wherever you see de La Salle in a Catholic institution, that's, that's these brothers. Oh, okay. Uh, and, um, you know, Thomas Aquinas was my, was my hero. And then, as I got more deeply into philosophy, uh, I, I began to sort of twist free from that. And the figure who made the, who did that for me, who sort of emancipated me from that that world, was Heidegger. Yeah. And in those days, you know, and this was the late '60s, uh, when I was a grad student. Um, we sort of knew about the Heidegger and the Nazi thing. Yeah, yeah. But the, the the public line was he had been in it for a year, figured out what a, that it was a mistake, and and got out. Yeah, that was the official line, and there were a lot of people who knew better, but we didn't. You know, Americans by and large didn't know better. Uh, I accepted it. You know, who, who hasn't done something really stupid in their life? And I, <laughs> and you know, he made a he made a mistake. Yeah. And, it's sort of interesting now to see people uh, getting on the Trump bandwagon, you know, and yeah. think, what were they thinking in 1933? Well, what are they thinking over here right now? Exactly. Uh, and so so I was able, in a certain, certain sense, to approach Heidegger sort of on his own terms and what he, what he was saying as a, as a philosopher. And uh, w without being distracted by the rest of it, and the rest of it came out in the in, in the eighties, and then I had to write a book in which I sort of stated stated my case. So I called the demythologizing Heidegger. But Heidegger emancipated me from that world that I grew up in, yeah. mostly by by way of introducing the principle of the philosophical principle of history and historicity and historicality, yeah, yeah. The historical construction. Okay? Yeah. And his notion of what he called ethics of being, you know, that, there, that being, being never actually serves itself up plain and simple. Being is always uh, delivered in historical yeah. content, in, yeah. in historical form. Yeah. So, and, and you know, that, that idea just sort of landed on me, like it was like thunder, lightning, you know, a bolt from the blue, because I had grown up in this world where things were agelessly true, yeah. you know, eternally true. And Thomas Aquinas 
they called him the angelic doctor. It was like he didn't have a body, you know. I remember one time I was reading his, uh, you know, I got to learn Latin really well so I could follow this stuff in the, in the original. And I remember at one point he made reference to the River Seine because he taught at Paris. Yeah. And I thought, glory be to God, he, he lived on Earth. <laughs> <laughs> was a, there was a river near the university. Yeah. And so when Heidegger, Heidegger's vision of things in terms of historical um, uh, presentations, a yeah. series of historical, historically confined and, and, and uh, limited revelations, was emancipatory to me. So he, you might say he introduced the idea of historical of things not being eternally true, but being historically constructed. Yeah. And from there, and I stayed with that for a long time. I mean, I was, for, for the better part of 20 years, immersed in, in, in Heidegger. And I studied everything else in connection uh, with Heidegger, sort of through, through Heidegger's lens, um, until in the 80s, I came upon Derrida, who, from my point of view, radicalized this idea of construction. Yeah. Because uh, he had a still more radical notion of construction in uh, what he was calling the construction, which, of course, was a French sort of gloss on Heidegger's own word, destruction. Yeah. That Heidegger, uses, Heidegger uses the word destruction. Uh, which is actually taken from Luther's Heidelberg Disputation. When, when Luther is critiquing what he calls the theology of glory, medieval scholasticism, yeah. and he, he opposes it to the theology of the cross, he says the theology of the cross is the destructio of the theology of glory, which recovers the living heart of the New Testament. Yeah. So it's a negative destruction, but they a retrieval, a repetition. And when I got to Derrida, I found, you know, this notion of, same notion of destruction, but uh, still more radically conceived. Yeah. Because I think in Heidegger, he came equipped with a kind of mythology about the originary truth of being in the early Greeks. Yeah. And um, it, it, was it, was, it was still too... Uh, you might say essentialistic. Sure. Whereas, whereas Derrida had a, a much more radical idea of construction. Yeah. And therefore, of, of seeing meaning uh, not as having dropped from the sky, but as having been forged in space and time contingently, fallibly, revisably, deconstructably. Um, yeah. But, but, and here's the thing. In the 70s, when this stuff, this, this stuff was, uh, uh, oh, uh, this stuff was au cran. This was hot. This yeah. was the, 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 all the, all the rogues were going deconstruction. Yeah. Uh, the, the first impression this left on a lot of people, including me, frankly, was that, it, that this, that this was a sort of, uh, out of control. Uh, 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 wild uh, it was uh, it, it was just a kind it was negative in its impact it was it was shaking the foundations and but not replacing them with anything yeah so my first reaction to it was negative mm, there was are a couple of, there are a couple of articles that I published at the time which I try to keep concealed but uh, everyone tells no one finds them <laughs> which I criticized there though on this point. Yeah. And I got a grant to do a, a, I got a year off from teaching and I got a grant to write what eventually became Radical Hermeneutics. And uh, I got to work on, I, I thought, well, you know, it's, it's going to be a, a, a kind of defense of Heidegger and Gadamer against this newfangled deconstruction. And I thought, but if I'm going to do this right, I better read this stuff, start from the beginning, and get it right. Yeah. And so I started reading Derrida assiduously, carefully, slowly, and in a very short time realized I had gotten the wrong impression that it, it had this deeply affirmative uh, power. Yeah. Uh, but 
and a deeply affirmative intent, which was, you know, I thought uh, emancipatory, and it loosened up what was uh, sedimented and, and, and uh, petrified, and gave it, as, as he would say, it would give an institution or a text or whatever it is that you're talking about deconstructing, it gives it, restores to it its future, you know, it opens it to its future. Yeah. Now, the thing that, that I thought, and for a long time I was just sort of peddling this, you know, without being able to support it uh, textually. But my first impression, just because of who I was and my background and my origins in Catholicism and my interest in religion, I thought this had a religious tone. Yeah. I thought there was something religious going on in this thing. I didn't know about the word that the word had come from Luther. I didn't know any of that. That that was not discovered until uh, the, the 90s by a man named John Van Buren, wrote a book called The Young Heidegger. I didn't know that. Um, but I, I, what I saw was a, an analogy with uh, Kierkegaard, yeah. which turned out to be right. And he had not said much about Kierkegaard, but he, as time went on, he began to say a little more. And I said, look, when, when Kierkegaard distinguishes the aesthetic, the ethical, and the universal, uh, and, the, and the religious, he's saying, he says the ethical is the universal. He's thinking like Kant, you know, it's the, 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 the categorical imperative is the universalizable. What if everybody did that? Ethics is universality. And then um, Kierkegaard said, or, or the pseudonyms say, there's something that falls below the universal, which is arbitrary, and that's the aesthetic. So it's 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 not universal because it's less than universal. It's arbitrary. It's um, indecisive. It, it's it goes. It's a bee going from flower to flower to flower. It, it just seeks pleasure. It just seeks to keep itself occupied and interested. And then there is. Uh, a breach of the universal, which is higher than the universal, which is beyond the universal, which is uh, deals with the exceptional and the unique, which to which the universal has no access. Right. It exceeds the universal, and that's the religious. And then, of course, the paradigmatic story is the one that scares the hell out of everybody, which is the story of Abraham and Isaac. That was his, his idea of religion. So the religion for him was transgression. Sure. Uh, so when I wrote an article, uh, one of the, in some ways the most important article I ever wrote about uh, Derrida, which I called, uh, in which I spoke of what I call a sacred anarchy, in which I said, look, the the breach of the universal in Derrida, which everybody is taking to be a kind of aestheticism, is not an aestheticism. It's religious. It's a religious breach of the universal, not an aesthetic one. Interesting. Where aesthetics is thought of that way, you know, as, as something less than the universal. Yeah. And um, that was sort of my intuition, you know, and my prejudice. Yeah. And my uh, and I thought, well, even if that's not what he means, that's what I mean. And, and I'm going to carry I'm going to carry that ball. Even, I'm going to follow him, even if he's not leading in that direction. <laughs> sure. I'm, I'm going to uh, march in march in the direction that he's not leading. Yeah. But then, in the middle eighties, he began to talk like that. He wrote a book about fear and trembling, and then he wrote this. Uh, he gave this famous uh, lecture. Uh, at the uh, Yeshiva School of uh, Law yeah. um, on the, what he called the force of law. And he made a distinction between justice and the law. Yeah. The law is the universal, and then justice, Sylvia now, justice, if there is such a thing, yeah. is not deconstructible. The law is deconstructible because it's constructive. Yeah, but justice, if there is such a thing, which of course there isn't, um, if there is, then he's Plato. Right. But yeah, justice, if there is such a thing, is not deconstructible. First time, and I'm sure of this. I asked him about it, and I've checked it. First time, 
he ever said something would not be destructible, ever spoke of the undestructible. Right. Just. So now you've got it. Now, now you've got it. There's the smoking gun. That's what I had been saying. Yeah. That there is a the undestructible is exceeds the universal. It doesn't fall short of it. It's beyond the universal. It's it's a what? Well, it's not a it's not an essence or an ideal that we approach asymptotically. Right. It's a it's a prayer. Yeah. Well, then, lo and behold, pretty much at the same time, within a year or so, he published this gloss on St. Augustine's uh, confession. Yeah. And of course, he was an Algerian, like, uh, it turns out Augustine grew up in, uh, um, in what is modern day Algeria. Oh. And, uh, he was born about, uh, and was a, a hippo, uh, he is about a hundred miles from Algiers. And, um, so Kieran Dioda, who, who loves the, the joke, uh, we refer to Augustine as his compatriot. And, he, um, he wrote this wonderful essay, strange, bizarre, funny, mysterious, puzzling uh, thing called Circumfession, Circumfession, Circum, Circum, so the Christian word for circumcision. Confession, circumcision, um, which was a riff on the confessions, right? In which he says, it reveals his religion, which no one knows about. He says, not even my mother, who should who should know. Yes, yeah. the name of God goes for me under other names. Interesting. And he begins to describe deconstruction in terms of uh, prayer. So if you look at the circumcision, you look at Augustine's confessions in the history of literature, they're considered to be the first autobiography. Yeah. But actually, if you look more closely at the genre, it's not exactly a, uh, it's not only uh, an autobiography, it's a prayer. Yeah. Well, and, yeah. I, think, I think the notion of an autobiography is is a fairly modern <laughs> modern conception anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, in a, uh, in a universe where you're surrounded by whatever you think you're surrounded by, it's a little hard to go, yeah, this is my story in in the sort of context. So yeah. let me stop you there because there's so many things um, to, to catch up on. Um, but um, <laughs> let me get a little thread here. So Aquinas is your man. And Heidegger comes along and drops in the 60s, which is an interesting time because the whole notion of historicity becomes quite big in lots of fields of study in the 60s. And we begin to look at the nature of the self in a very different way. Um, so you get this sense, I'm just making sure I'm tracking with you. So you get this sense from Heidegger that there's something um, about historicity that has importance for you personally, but also in terms of your faith, right, which we'll come back to, right? right? Yeah. And from Heidegger, you get to Derrida. The thing, the thing actually that struck me most uh, in what you've said so far is, is probably a, a, a sidebar, really, and and that is that the thing that that and one of the reasons I wanted to um, do some of these conversations with people is, you know, in in the world. In the worlds that you and I inhabit, at least in terms of talking to people about religion and church and stuff like that, there's a lot of voguish conversations about deconstruction or Lacan or Zizek or, you know, continental philosophy. And, it, and it's very easy for that to be looked at uh, on a surface thing for the hot, for the hot points, you know. But, um, I, I, I do think that, that digging deep down into the material it is um, a little, and I know it's hard, but it's an overlooked necessity in, in terms of these, these people and these thinkers can really impact what we're thinking about and what we're trying, what we're trying to do. But we can sort of it's one of the problems with continental philosophy, I think, is that you do tend to get dazzled by the glamour of, of brilliant people. Yeah. Who, who have brilliant and idiosyncratic styles yeah. 
and then you get somewhat lost in that, in, in that to the neglect of what in phenomenology called the, the things themselves, you know, yeah. the, the, the issues. Yeah. So, so Derrida gives you this notion of uh, deconstruction, and while you're exploring that, you sense this uh, religious dynamic component within the work of, uh, of Derrida, which at the time was probably not picked up on, right? I mean, and now that's a fairly... It, it had only been picked up, it had been picked up on, but in terms of the textualism of Derrida, so that there were Jewish scholars who said, this is very Jewish, you know, he's just got a text here and he wants to argue about it, you know? And I mean, that's true, there's no doubt about that. But, yeah. but I was saying, well, it's more, it's not only that, it's not only that. So, um, so what happens to uh, the little Catholic boy <laughs> working out? Working out. The, I mean, where does this? What does this do to you in, in terms of particularly your thinking about religion, belief, faith? Well, I mean, what happens? Put it, put it in a very simple way: is, is, is it tells you that theology should always be conducted from below. That is to say. Uh, by w what we're doing when we think theologically is uh, work we're involved in human constructions. Sure. We're, we're trying to give words to something which is not subjectivistic in the sense that we're, I, I'm not saying theology is expression is simply expressionism or that it's yeah. Schleiermacher where we're trying to record our feelings. Yeah. Um, I, I really do think that there's something which has breaks in on us, which is uh, which overtakes us, which, to which we're trying to give expression. We're trying to give words and images and, and song and and enact it yeah. um, in 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 highly constructed and therefore deconstructible. Uh, terms. Yeah. Um, so that the, what, what becomes uppermost, what becomes salient when you start thinking like this, is the, the, uh, you, you sort of remove the authoritarianism in, in religious traditions and religious texts, and you begin to see them as constructions of people trying to come come to grips with something which is mysterious and uh, which, by which they've been overtaken. So the history of theology is the history of human constructions to say something which keeps e eluding our grip. Yeah. Um, and which may today, I mean, I, one of the things that I'm interested in right now is the way the physicists are starting to sound like this. You know, the speculative cosmologists are starting to sound like this. Yeah. Uh, they're becoming uh, overwhelmed by the by the mystery of what they're talking about, and, and um, yeah, I think it's just the mystical dimension to, to contemporary uh, physics right now. Yeah, um, so, so you see theology as forging uh, the good word, you know, means of means of something fake, <laughs> yeah. a forging, but yeah. something constructed. You see, there's this endlessly um, deconstructable. Uh, uh, um, series of, of attempts to to say something that is has got the better of us. Yeah. So there's always something undeconstructable, something uh, luring us yeah. uh, that is driving this thing. The yeah. things are are, de are deconstructable, not just simply from below because they've been forged from below as human construction. But because of something beyond them, you know, which is sort of calling them from yeah. above, from not from above in another world, but from yeah. the future, or from uh, giving giving words to our hope, yeah, our, our desire, our, our, our prayer. But in many, I mean, in many ways, that runs counter to a a, a more perhaps traditionally Catholic view of how things play out, right? Well, sure. I mean, but, uh, so, and you know. it, it resists 
it resists on the Protestant side, it resists the inerrantism of a, of a word. Yeah. And on the Catholic side, it resists the inerrantism of a, of a, of a, of a tradition. Yeah. I mean, once you radically historicize both the word and the tradition, yeah. both the text and the, and the historical uh, uh, memory, yeah. once you see the radical contingency of those things, uh, then both the Catholic and the Protestant side of things are, are become equally uh, fallible and, and de deconstructible. There, I once said that the very best way to deconstruct something is to write a meticulous history of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. You know, once you put all, hang it all out on the line for everyone to see. Yeah, you see what it, you see what you see. You see where how it got to be what it is. I remember when I was uh, a young professor, and, and I, I said to my mother, I told my mother that um, the rosary was a medieval devotion. It was developed in the, the 12th century, I think, in uh, sometime in the Middle Ages by followers of Mary, and and she nearly perished. You know, she nearly died. You know, she thought this was something that the Virgin Mary had instructed us to do. You know, she thought. Yeah. <laughs> she just thought this was an eternal the, the piece yeah. of the furniture. And I thought, well, that, I learned a lesson from that, which was not to say much more about what, what I was doing as a professor and uh, not, not, not to my mother. And you know, that's the effect. Of it. Once you see where all this comes from, yeah. then you see it's been constructed. Now, the, at that point, you have a choice, either to, to, to dismiss it because it's been constructed. But that's foolish because what isn't constructed, everything is constructed. That's, yeah. that, that doesn't, that's not the end of the story. That's yeah. the beginning of the story. Yeah. And so then the real question is, well, what's it trying to do? What's, what is it uh, dreaming of? What is it praying for? And... That was one of the interesting things about that book that Derrida wrote called Sir Confession. He, he really did mine uh, the, the form of the book as a prayer. Yeah. So the whole book is addressed to you, just like St. Augustine. Saint Augustine the, 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 now that we have computers, somebody counted that the word you, te in Latin, occurs uh, 560 times or something like that. And so well, Derrida, in this circumcision thing, kept, was addressing you. <laughs> so when we would, he would come over to the United States. He was sort of Elvis, you know. We, 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 I met him early on, and we, we got to know him pretty well. And I said, who, who are you talking to? <laughs> and right. he was like, well, uh, he said, uh, he said, he said one time, he, he said, if I knew that, uh, I would know everything. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so now you're armed with, so you've made this um, shift in your thinking that's profound, really, over a, a period of a couple of decades. And you've come yeah. to this new space where now everything, essentially everything is up for deconstruction, right? That's the, that's the lens that you're now looking at, at the world. And yet, um, and, and as you said, um, it, you can walk away, but there's really no point because everything is everything is up for deconstruction. So you walk away from one thing, you're going to walk into something else. But for many people, um, that would maybe um, lead to some kind of I don't know loss of faith, crisis of faith, uh, abandonment of faith. So did, did, was there any of that in there, or did you just see this as opportunity? Well, there was, there was a while there. Uh, I guess when I was first sort of unloosening the bonds of, yeah. of uh, Catholicism, there was a bond. There was a time there when I was I tended to I, I had buried myself in philosophy. I buried myself in Husserl and Kant and, and the whole the phenomenological movement, and I wasn't paying a lot of attention to. To uh, religious questions, I was just—I I was really immersing myself in philosophy. But it—it it, 
I always uh, I, I use the image in Hooping Against Hoop, which is where I wrote about a lot of this stuff. Of uh, every, every time I I thought I had left religion behind, I would find it sort of waiting for me, you know, with the arms folded and you know leaning against the wall, waiting yeah. and saying, "Well, it's about saying it, it's about time you showed up," you know. Yeah. So, I never uh, it was a circular. I would, I would never leave it. I would always find myself returning to it. And eventually I just reached the conclusion that in fact, once you understand, once you relieve theology and religion of the supernaturalism, which is I think the real problem, once you, to put it in Husserlian terms, once you bracket the supernaturalism yeah. and you, you see these texts and traditions and practices and communities for what they are, you know, you, human constructions, human Frail mortal attempts, uh, gropings. Uh, then they speak for them. They, they, you sort of let you free them up so that you can let them speak for themselves, and then they become genuinely interesting narratives, parables. And and the thing that struck me was they were the sort of things that the philosophers were not likely to say. Yeah, you know. But when you look at the philosophers, you look at someone like Aristotle, who was, uh, I think, of, on the short list of the great ones for me. Yeah. Because he was critiquing idealism. His model is of the best and the brightest. You know, his 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 uh, man, and he meant man, of practical wisdom, was you know one of the best and the brightest. You know, he he went to Harvard. He was good looking. He grew up in a prosperous family, sure. and uh, he, he was well educated, and he had the best instincts. He got all the girls, and he was smart. He was smart, and he was good. Mm. If you look, you look at the New Testament. It's the opposite. You know, there's three of them: lepers, and the outcast, and the poor, and the lame, and the broken. You know, it's a completely different world. It's a it's much more of a sort of Foucaultian world, you yeah. know, the, the downcast and the outcast and the, and the downtrodden. And the the thing was not practical wisdom, like Aristotle was talking about, but mercy, compassion, yeah. forgiveness. Yeah. It's, it's a different set of categories. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, that was taken sort of, let's say, phenomenological. You know, forget about the supernaturalism. Forget about the divine revelation that breaks into space and time. Forget about all that. Put that out of action. Yeah. And take these things for the union phenomena that they are. Yeah. This, was, this was opening up a world where, where mercy reigned. You know, the kingdom of God is a kingdom of compassion and mercy. Yeah. It's funny. Yes. Yeah, I spent a lot of time um, last year. Well, actually, I've been, I've been sitting on it for for quite um, a lot of time. But um, I, I, I actually did a, a, a series of talks called Pure Filth. And it was based on um, that statement from Jesus um, to the Pharisees, to go and learn this, that I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And I thought it was very interesting um, that, there was actually a way in which mercy and sacrifice can't live with each other, that they are, if you like, two different worlds. Maybe the sacrifice connects to the world of supernaturalism because to a degree, you know, the making of sacrifices is towards this supernatural big other or whatever you want to call it, whereas mercy is embedded in uh, the human. It's a more horizontal um vertical experience but yeah I've, I've, I've been trying to think that one it's, it's, it's hard I mean in Derrida's terms marriage, sacrifice belongs to an economy yeah it belongs to an economy of exchange yeah whereas mercy belongs to uh, the gift yeah which, in which you give without the expectation of a return yeah and it's interesting, you know, one of the things that interests me is Matthew 25, yeah. where you have this absolutely gorgeous, beautiful core 
in the, in the chapter where the, uh, the, the when they say, Lord, when do we see you hungry and, and give you to eat or thirsty and give you to drink? Because they were just doing that because they, they were giving relief to the hungry and the thirsty because the hungry were hungry and the thirsty were thirsty. Period. They were thinking about the Lord. Yeah. Now, that it seems to me is is the core phenomenon, the, the radical phenomenon there. But then that thing gets inserted in this meta narrative about the coming of the Son of Man. Yeah. Where if you don't do that, we we will punish you beyond all imagining. Yeah. And if you do do that, we'll reward you with rewards beyond all imagining. And they completely ruins the figure. It, yeah. it, the, the, the human moment there is yeah. crossed by this theological meta narrative. Yeah. But what do you do? What do you do um, with? I mean, you, you you spoke about bracketing supernaturalism, which I, I I totally get. But obviously, when you're when you're talking about religion and engaging with religious people, um, supernaturalism is essentially unbracketed and all all consuming and all governing you know it, it, it is very much the the, the narrative of, of matthew 25 you better do this because you reap what you sow and uh, and so on and so forth how how do you how did you personally handle that and how do you see that in terms of i mean do you just see that as just um historicity working out is that or, or what what do you do with like metaphysics and the the ongoing supernaturalist and metaphysical impulses of Christianity? Well, when you judge people, not just personally, but when when you think about these things. Well, I mean, that's obviously the subject matter of critique for me. That's that's uh, overcoming metaphysics, the critique of onto theology, all of that. I mean, I, I, I there I would mount arguments against it. I mean, it's, it's like now, how good those arguments are, or, or not how good they are, but how effective they are, is a totally different question. Because I don't think that when you argue with people who hold those views, I don't think it's merely a matter of argument. Uh, yeah. and I, don't, I don't think it's a matter of reason through, yeah. thought, thought through. I, I, I think there's something deeply visceral yeah. at, at stake. Yeah. I was I, I was thinking particularly um, of, of uh, again people that that we might encounter mutually who have um, come to the end of a cycle of religious belief and practice and they are enticed by a future <laughs> that they can't see or name yet but they struggle to let go of those conceptions. You know what I mean? That so the supernaturalism still drives. I think that's our audience. Yeah, we, that's our niche. You know, we yeah. we um, we're we're not going to get a hearing from from people who are immersed in that world. No, and we're not going to get a hearing from people who simply who dismiss it. You know, who think that religion is poison. Yeah. Uh, our, my audience, and I think your audience, is these people who don't know what they believe, yeah. who don't believe nothing, and don't believe something determinate either. You know, yeah. they, they don't want to just give up. They give up the story they've been told, yeah. but they don't want to give up, period. Yeah. And they are looking, searching for, for something. Yeah. And that, that's exactly, I mean, my hope in the United States anyway, is that the young evangelicals are more and more like that. Yeah. That they're, they're distrustful of the, the hypocrisy and the, and the misogyny and, and the uh, patriarchy and the sexism and the homo homophobia of their elders. Yeah. And they're... They're, they're becoming more suspicious, more questioning about, about that whole thing. So they don't quite believe that anymore. But on the other hand, they don't, they're not just 
as the Homer Simpson says, uh, I don't believe anything. I'm going to become a lawyer. Um, you know, they're, they're not ready to do that. Yeah. <laughs> and I think they're the people that we can talk to. There, there's, there's a window there. And you, it, it's the advantage of teaching undergraduates. When you, when I was a college teacher, you get college students are often at that point. Yeah. What we call the nuns are like that. Yeah. They're, I mean, that, and that for me is the very vivid example of what Derrida would call the undeconstructible. There, yeah. There's something, something stirring in the things that, in the stories that we've been told that we are not going to give up on. Uh, something. Uh, there's a promise. There's a, there's a memory of something that never was, and the promise of something that never will be. That keeps us going. And and is, yeah. Is that what you think is? Uh, is that your takeaway from Derrida for people? That that's what he puts on the table for for us. Absolutely. With regards. Uh, to that is the prayers and tears of Jacques Derrida was exactly that argument, and. Uh, it was, in a sense, it, it was a book which could, which, which had no audience, you know, because yeah. these people would not be receptive to deconstruction, and deconstructors were not receptive to religion. Yeah. Um, but it, it uh, I think Derrida himself, as his own work moved along, um, made it clear that that is what he was talking about. That's yeah. that's what he meant. In, in the early works, if, if you look back and say, well, what about, was this like a Heideggerian reversal? You know, did he go from one position to a, a very, very different one later on? And I would say no. I would say he always had the notion of something undeconstructible, although he didn't use that language. But early on, the, the, what was undeconstructible for him was the work of art. Yeah. It was... For, for example, he, he, he would speak about um, the untranslatable poem. Yeah. A poem that would be so steeped and immersed in the idiomaticity of the language in which it is written. Yeah. That it would be untra completely untranslatable. You just, you would give up. You wouldn't even try. Yeah. And such a thing could not be done because it would have to be done in a language which was so idiomatic that nobody would understand even the native speakers. No one would understand it. Yeah. And he said, well, that's okay. It, but that's, the, that's what I'm dreaming of. I'm, I'm dreaming of a poem that no one can translate. That was the undeconstructed. Mm, interesting. Uh, and as he went on, now part of the problem, this part of the explanation here is, is autobiographical. He started to get a lot of heat from critics, particularly on the left, Marxists, yeah. who said this was all apolitical, it was asceticism. Yeah. And, I, and of course he's Paris, you know, everybody was a Marxist in, in the 60s when he was, when he was getting, uh, a student. Um, so, uh, so part of after that kind of criticism, I think he began to turn towards ethics and politics uh, and to speak more directly about them. Yeah. And when he did, this religious tonality started to emerge. And the undeconstructable t turned out to be uh, things like justice. Yeah. yeah the gift, yeah. hospitality, forgiveness. Hmm. Uh, things that had a they were Jewish, you know, they're very biblical. I mean, he grew up in uh, in a not a reactionary Jewish family, but it was actually an integrated Jewish family, French speaking Jewish family, uh, but Jewish. You know, and in, in particular, his mother was, was 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 pious. So he had all this stuff in his head, you know. And uh, when he went to went to Paris to study, he thought he was done with it. Uh, but it, it wasn't. Yeah. And Levy, in part, never, Levy, not, are we? Huh? We're never done with things, are we? Yeah, your your origin is your future. 
Or, or, or I forgot the, 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 the Heidegger says that in German, in, in, in plays of the German word Herkunft origin. I've forgotten what he said. Yeah, in, 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 my, in my Herkunft, my origins is my Zukunft, my, my future. Where I come from is where I'm coming to, or what's coming to me. Um, so yeah, so, so, so then uh, what was there all along, and what had originally taken the form of, it, of his interest in, in, in literature, above all literature, you know, he, he spoke about some other things, but the, the, above all literature when he was young, then, became uh, ethico-political and, and then overtly religious. Yeah. And it was its own kind of religion because there was no God. There. It was religion. The religious for him uh, meant this uh, kind of un, this yearning or desire or prayer. He called it a prayer yeah. for something undeconstructible. He said he, said he was, described himself as a man of prayer. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's been 30, almost 40 years that you've been working with Derrida now, probably. Um, is he still your prime thinking partner? He's he's my favorite unofficial theologian. But in the meantime, you know, I've had to pick up some official theologians to, to go along with it in order to do what I do. So I've spent a certain amount of time working with uh, uh, the people who do work on the historical Jesus, which I, I think is wonderfully scandalous and, you know, uh, revelatory. Yeah. Um, and then lately, in the last few years, uh, at a certain point, I found myself, when I was still teaching, saying to myself, I'm starting to sound like Tillich. You know, I'm, I, what, what, what I'm calling the undeconstructible, and when I talk about it and use it uh, in theological work, it's beginning to sound like what he called the unconditional. Yeah. And being seized by something of unconditional importance. Yeah. And uh, now, so so really, what I've been doing lately has involved a certain collaboration between Tillich and Derrida. I don't do, I haven't been doing, I haven't done in a long time, sort of academical, philological, exegetical work with Derrida. I've, yeah. I've, I've sort of stopped doing that, and I've been writing more with. with in the American Academy of Religion, they call constructive theology. So uh, I've been trying to to work out this notion of radical theology, theopoetics, weak theology um, for myself. Yeah. And, and especially since I've retired, I, I don't have I don't have uh, academic I don't have department meetings and grades to turn in and, and I, so I've been able to work more freely and, and yeah. creatively but the background voice that now is coming into the foreground for me is uh, a lot of what Tillich said now of course you can't take what Tillich said uh, straightforwardly because yeah. it ultimately goes back to German idealism yeah. and he had a very modern idea of culture when he talked about the theology of culture yeah. he thought of culture I mean that was the 1950s yeah exactly I, yeah, I think he, yeah. he he looked on he could see postmodern culture beginning to emerge in art. Yeah, and he thought it was crazy, and he didn't do anything to do with it. You know, yeah. So. I th yeah, I think he I, I think he can help, maybe methodologically. More, you know, but you can't take him too much at his word. You have well historicity. <laughs> I mean. Yeah. The, 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 the dynamics that he describes of the relationship between the unconditional and the conditional yeah. are analogous to the dynamics of the relationship of the undeconstructible and a given construction. Yeah. And his talk about the the, the symbol yeah. is uh, corresponds to what Derrida says when he says there is no transcendental signified. Um, but ultimately, Tillich is a German, coming from German idealism. He's yeah. got a notion of Geist, yeah. so he thinks the culture is inhabited by a deep spirit which is expressing itself. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, that's metaphysics. In the, that's metaphysics in the sense that I, I think you can't do metaphysics anymore. It's, uh, I, I've, I've sort of eased up a little bit on the word metaphysics because I think... <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, but, but like my friend Jeff Robbins said, he yeah. said, said look, if, he says, if you're willing to talk about a, a radical hermeneutics and a radical theology, and he says, well, why don't you see a more radical her- metaphysics, yeah. you know, or a weak metaphysics as opposed to a strong metaphysics? And I say, well, okay, in, the, you know, in, in that sense, if, if what you mean by metaphysics is a kind of hypothetical, tentative uh, construction of how things are, you know, what, 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 what reality is. Yeah. Um, okay. But, but not, not metaphysics in the strong sense, where it thinks it's got first principles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it thinks that it's got plugged in to the things themselves. And on this point, I agree with Lacan. And you don't hear me say that very often, but sure. I do agree with Lacan. I, I do think that uh, the real, in that sense, yeah, you don't get it. You, know, you don't. You don't have any access to it. You, you. We have symbolic and imaginative versions of it, but, but we, don't, we don't get it. We don't get the real. Uh, yeah. And, and now, I, now for me, that's not. A, I, I don't think of those. That, the only difference I have with Lacan and with Pete and with Zizek is I don't like to think of all that in terms of black. I like to think of it in terms of. <laughs> How many times have we had this conversation? Right. I like to think of it in terms of excess. Yeah. Not not black. Um, I, I think that's why I think it's that's what fer- keeps thought. And history fertile. Yeah. You know, oh, it's it's a sort of restlessness. Yeah. There's a restlessness in being that that won't settle. Um. But but I think that that's so so I think whereas metaphysics in a strong sense is trying to can once as Hegel said it wants a concept wants wants to conceive grasp yeah. the reality. And uh, that's the metaphysics that I, I reject. I, I, what, but what, what I accept is what you might call a kind of uh, uh, hermeneutic ontology, you know, where we're, we're describing the relationship between being and us, where it's the relationship. Yeah. It's not, it's not merely subjectivistic, and there's no such thing as the act, gaining access to a pure object. It's the relationship yeah. that we inhabit. Which is what Aristotle said. Yeah, there you go. Back to him. Yeah, Aristotle had it, had this this argument with realism and idealism. It was settled by Aristotle, I think, a long time ago, when he said he said um, the knower and the known are one in the act of knowledge. Mm. The, the knower in its the the ability to know. Yeah. And the ability to to be known yeah. are potencies that are actualized in the same act, in mm. which in the act of knowing. In the act of knowing, there's a knowing side and there's a being known side, but there's this different sides of the one unity, and that unity is the subject matter of philosophy and theology and of human experience. When that unity is broken, our problems are solved. <laughs> <laughs> so well, we're, we're dependent on you for that. Anyway, I've kept, you, I've kept you for quite some time, so we should probably wrap up. But one last thing: what what are you working on at the moment? At in this, your, in uh, your lazy retirement years. Well, I just put out a new book on uh, hermeneutics, which just appeared. Uh, you've, you've seen that book. You, you yeah, I did, a, I, did a, I did a reading group on it. I haven't. How'd that go? But, it was great. Uh, I think it's. I think I said to you, it was. I thought it was one of the more um, accessible and concise and really clear works that you've put out there. And I don't mean that to disparage any of your others. It was just the way it was written was so great that it was. There were ropes to swing from in every chapter. Well, it, it was a. I wasn't fishing for a compliment there, by the way. But uh, that, yeah, it was written for a trade press for, for Penguin. <laughs> Pen, Pen, that's what Penguin tortured me half to death, you know, with uh, revisions till I got it in, into that. Till I got it at that pitch. That's what they wanted. Yeah, I so think that it, just came out. 
And I have a book now that's uh, in press with Indiana University Press, which is for an academic audience, uh, which is basically going with uh, taking its point of departure from Luther's Heidelberg disputation and the, lo and the logic, the theology of the cross, and sort of running with it. Okay. Remembering that tradition that goes from Luther to Heidegger to Derrida. It's, that's m my version of the theology of the cross. Theology from, that's from what you're saying. yeah, that's that. So it's completely heretical, and you know the the real Lutherans will pull their hair out. So that's, um, that's, you call that weak Trinity? Yes, that that you do that. <laughs> so it is called cross and cosmos, ah. a, a theology of difficult glory. So I'm I'm looking for you know I'm not going to. I don't, I don't want to wallow in the cross. I want to have a notion of genuine glory. Yeah. But I call it, it difficult glory because the glory is embedded in the cross. The, the victory is embedded in the defeat. And so you say, well, where's the victory in the cross? Well, for me, the victory in the cross is not, you know, a metaphysical theology of resurrection and we, and we all get to have glorious bodies in, in heaven. For me... In the story of the cross, the victory in the defeat is the act of forgiveness. Mm. When Jesus forgives his executioners, he rises up. You know, he is resurrected. He ascends above the violence of the world. And so then I, so, so I'm arguing that, that death is, is not a punishment for anything. Death is an ingredient in life. And so, the, the glory of life is embedded in the mortality. It's not, it's not a reward that follows mortality. It's the glory that is put on life by mortality, which makes life precious. Yeah. So I follow that argument out in the first half of the book. And the second half, half of the book, so it's called Cross and Cosmos, second half of the book, I say, well, you know, the same thing is true, not only uh, for our personal lives, but for the... The earth, which is, uh, and the sun. Yeah. The sun is not a, a endlessly renewable energy. The sun is burning itself out. And if we listen to the cosmologists right now, the prevailing view is that the cosmos itself is just expanding into oblivion. Yeah. And so does that mean life is a useless passion, you know, a fool, a uh, fool's uh, goal? No. It, it means that this moment, this little tiny place in a distant quarter of the universe, mm -hmm. in this, this short bit of cosmic time, where there will have been life, is all the more precious. So... That's, a, that's an interesting... Uh... So that's the difficult glory. So, that, so that's, that's, that's coming out. And then right at this very moment, I'm working on uh, religious violence. I'm try, trying to understand... Uh, There's not much about these days. I don't know why you <laughs> picked that as a topic. <laughs> you, you know, um, the, there's a new edition of On Religion uh, coming uh, out. It's coming out very soon, in the next few weeks, actually. Oh, and great. The, the main reason... That, Routledge wanted me to do a second edition of the book, and I've always hesitated to mess with it because it's my bestseller. You know, it's actually the book that sold the most copies, and I was—I'm afraid to screw it up. You know, leave, leave, it's in the leave well enough alone category. Yeah. Uh, but they said to me, you can't, "It was written before 2001. Yeah. You can't, you can't, you know, you need to update this. You, you've got to talk about religious violence." And So I wrote a chapter on religious violence, which will be in this new uh, edition. Interesting. Well, and I, and I, like, I like what I did with it, and so now I think I'm going to expand that into uh, a book. And uh, the, the violence, I, uh, like right now, if the book had to come out tomorrow and they needed a title, I would call it Violence and the Unconditional. Ah, that's a great <laughs> title. In, in terms of what we've been talking about, you could call it violence and the undeconstructible. Yeah. Because the notion of the unconditional or the undeconstructible could lead to violence, right? You know, when, when, if you think you've got some access to that, I, I think that's, that has something to do with violence. Anyway, that's what I'm working on right now.
Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Jack. It's always, I always love speaking with you. And uh, well, good to uh, see you. The, the feeling is mutual, and I've enjoyed uh, your work over the years, and uh, keep up the good work. And I hope you come back to the United States sometime when, when, when the wave, the Trump wave has passed over us. <laughs> you, Maybe so. You, you, you're di- you've dived under the uh, the wave, and uh, so after, after it's all over, you can come back. <laughs> yeah, I might come back before just to keep it messy. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, all right. Thank you very much for, for hearing me out. Oh, my- thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.